we right now we have a period of time for questions and answers from the audience. So I hope we puzzled you enough or uh, piqued your interest enough that uh, we couldn't possibly have answered all of your economic questions here, but uh, we're going to try now. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. So, uh, Robert, from Robert Cates' numbers, we might perceive from that that we're in some uh, anecdotal recovery. So, are we in a real recovery or is it just a little bit? Yeah, referring to the numbers from Ro Robert Higgs that I mentioned and presented. Um, and the question is are we in a real recovery? <clears throat> well, I think what this indicates is that we're not in a real recovery that, um, you know, given all of the stimulus that's out there, all the deficit spending and the uh, quantitative easing, all of that stuff that the government is using to prop up gross domestic product, uh, that further suggests that we haven't reached a return to normalty. Now, I would suggest that uh, real net domestic private investment, the 100 index in 2007, was probably too high. They stimulated the economy too much. And as a result, we got the business cycle, which took us down. But I, you know, at a number 40% below that, more than 40% below that indicates that entrepreneurs are still not willing to invest. If you look outside of the aggregate number, and that's the first thing Austrians do, you, you see an aggregate, and the first thing we do want to do is take it apart. When Peter showed that cake, I thought, I want to get inside that cake. Um, so if you look outside of that, what you see is record amounts of cash on corporate balance sheets. So if you look at the major businesses, now there's small business, medium-sized business, local and regional business, but if you look at corporate America, what you see is a record amount of cash on their balance sheets, either held domestically or by their foreign subsidiaries outside of the US. And that's a great indicator that entrepreneurs are very uncertain um, about in making investments because they're holding that cash rather than putting it to work with new outlets, new businesses, new products, and things of that nature. You can actually just add a note to that. Um, Remember that from our point of view, uh, what's, what matters is not simply the level of investment, but the, the specific goods and services that that investment is embodied in. It's not just how much is invested, it's what you invest in. And the reason that we ha are in a recession in the first place is the, the hangover effect of a previous artificial boom that was created by government stimulation of the economy. Interest rates near zero. Uh, entrepreneurs are investing in projects that are not consistent with the pattern of goods and services that consumers ultimately want. Uh, there was too much investment in consumer durables and long-run investment projects. Recovery, from, for the, for, uh, you know, from, from an Austrian perspective, consists of liquidating the bad investments and getting money redirected into good investments. You know, Mark talked about the Chinese, uh, you know, phantom cities or the cake that was made by the central planners. The government can certainly do that. It can do a lot of investment, but it's not investment that's valuable. It's not investment that is in the right things. So recovery means a painful period of liquidation and readjustment. The Fed and the Treasury and Congress have done everything in their power to prevent any adjustments any reallocation, and thus any true recovery since 2008. I hope that wasn't misleading when I, I probably should have kept the, the net part off of there uh, so as to not to confuse anybody. Questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, um, imagine, I'm just repeating just uh, for people on, online, imagine that someone builds a super net and manages to catch 
all the fish and doesn't leave anything for uh, uh, the other people. Is that still a good thing? Uh, but well, the thing is that remember, like, like I said in that one slide, there's only so much fish that he can consume himself. There's only so much good that he can get out of consumption from um, a stock of fish as the stock gets bigger and bigger. So again, the only way that he can benefit from the fish is to make exchanges with other people in the community. And like I said, is that every exchange is mutually beneficial. It's a win-win situation. So eventually um, people will benefit, not just him. I would like to add to that, <clears throat> add to that the, uh, because it's sort of a looming problem. What if everybody, or what if one person got in there and took all the resources and destroyed it and, and so on? Those types of things do happen, but they typically only happen in an environment where there's no private property. So in the Old West, the buffalo were hunted to near extinction because they were nobody's property and there was no pro private property allocation out west. And so hunters faced a, a near zero marginal cost of shooting another buffalo and, and you know, killing the buffalo off like that. But things like that only happen where there's no private property assignments where people have not been able to take possession of property. And so you sometimes do see problems like this in uh, public waterways and things of that nature where there's no, there's no private property assignments. Yeah, I have a question about um, GDP. Uh, we're talking about how it can be easily manipulated to uh, see like, seem like there's economic growth and there really isn't. Um, but is GDP even a relevant statistic at all if it's so easily manipulated and there's so many things that are not real economic growth that go into GDP, uh, is it even a thing worth tracking? Or is there something, some other better method of tracking economic growth? It's a very poor method of, of tracking uh, economic growth. If you have a market economy where there is very little government intervention, it's uh, somewhat reasonable. I mean, it's a government accounting system. Um, you know, if you so if you had a market economy, it's a reasonable account of the production of final goods and services. Uh, but there's a lot of problems with it um, in general, which the people who put these things together originally they laid out a whole list of why you can't use this to do X, Y, and Z. And so from the very beginning, it had a lot of problems. And the fact that you have a lot of government intervention rigging the numbers on a regular basis makes it even more problematic. But it's what is the standard of debate in the profession as it exists. Yeah, there have been some attempts by Austrians and other scholars to come up with better aggregate measures, looking at gross private product only, excluding government expenditures and so forth. And these have some advantages relative to GDP. But I think the premise of your question is, is right, that ultimately no measure like this is exactly a measure of well-being in an economy, right? Because well-being is subjective and personal. Um, the amount of value or satisfaction I get from consuming goods or services is not something that's reflected in any number that could be summed up across individuals. So all of these measures, I mean, they do provide some information as crude proxies for things that are going on at a macroeconomic level, but we should always take them with a grain of skepticism, a dose of skepticism. Yeah, one thing that you might Google is Murray Rothbard and uh, PPR. It's a, a measurement that Murray Rothbard developed called private product remaining. Question. For individuals? for individuals? Okay, yeah, I did talk about the cash on corporate balance sheets, and the question is about private savings. Um, and according to the statistics, what happened over this business, this past business cycle, is that the private savings rate, which is one measure of the amount of savings that individuals do 
outside of corporate balance sheets, that pri the private sa savings rate went down to zero during the boom. And that's exactly what Austrians would predict is because, you know, you think in a boom conditions, people would be saving more. But what's happening is the lower interest rate is encouraging investment at the same time it's discouraging savings. And the difference between basically real savings and real, real amount of investment is you're going to get a lot of male investments or bad investments. Now, what happened since the crisis emerged in 2008 is that the savings rate has gone up to about 5%, I think. Uh, but that's still only half of what the traditional savings rate of Americans has been. So it's, you know, we, we view savings as a good thing, adding to the produ productive side of the economy. Uh, and that's recovered, according to the st statistics, about halfway back. I would imagine so. Yeah, I mean, I think people are deleveraging their own personal balance sheets as well. Yeah, which is something that Keynesian economists are very unhappy about, right? But it, you know, it, it's funny if you just start start paying attention as you read the newspaper, you see something online, or you listen to a news report about the economy. How often the dominant um, uh, uh, the, the main focus is on total consumer expenditures. Consumer spending went up. Yay, everything's going great. Consumer spending went down. Gee. Um, and, and you hear them say, well, consumer spending does make up a large share of GDP. Therefore, more consumer spending means higher GDP. We're all better off. Right? If you think about this systematically, starting with Danny's presentation and going through Marx, you realize that that has everything exactly backwards. And that what we're interested in is uh, the free market allocating resources according to people's wishes, absent artificial intervention and stimulation from the state. But I mean, what, what the economy needs right now in practical terms is less consumer spending and more savings. And that's exactly the opposite of sort of the conventional wisdom you get from New York or Washington, D.C. or whatever. Yeah, it's basically saying, like the people on the island saying, we ate so much fish today, we're going to be so rich. <laughs> That's a great question because it does draw another one of those distinctions where Austrians and mainstream economists basically have a completely different point of view and a different form of analysis. And ours is better, of course. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're right. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? Yes. No, savings is not the sa same thing as um, a decreases in the velocity of money, which is a statistic designed to measure the number of times the average dollar uh, is in circulation. Um, so those are somewhat distinct uh, concepts. Savings is taking away consumption and making it available for investment. Yes. Okay, the question is, if uh, savings is a good thing, would it be better to tax spending rather than income? So um, Murray Rothbard, what the point that he would always stress is that people pay too much attention to the kind of tax. And what's more important is the height of the tax. Um, and so, um, and in Man, Economy, and State, he, he explains how um, all taxes um, eventually get borne by um, land and labor. 
And so really, uh, again, that, that's what's more important. Um, related to the brigands, uh, someone posted a, a question on, on YouTube saying that, um, well, the government protects us from brigands. So it, it doesn't make sense to, to think of them as brigands. Now, if you go back to the story and, and you think about it, so say the brigands come in and they become kings and nobles and they plunder through taxation, are they going to like it if other brigands come in and start looting their subjects? No. Why not? Yeah. If, if, it, if, if other brigands um, loot the people and makes them poorer, then it's less for the, the government brigands to plunder. So it, it makes them poor. So of course they're going to want to, to protect them from other brigands because they're saying, hey, these are our victims. Uh, get, uh, stay out of this. With, with the mob, with the mafia, it's what you call a protection racket. But uh, with the government, we call it the social contract. <laughs> <laughs> Just, again, a small comment on consumption tax. A lot of people have proposed replacing the income tax with some kind of maybe a value-added tax or some other kind of consumption tax. It's an interesting point. Um, but to, to echo what Danny said, in, in addition to the level of the tax being more important than the specific collection procedure, there are also a number of interesting practical and sort of political difficulties, I think, with most of those proposals. So the, their, their proponents have in mind that we will institute a VAT or some other kind of consumption tax, and then after that start, you know, reducing income taxes and uh, other kinds of business uh, taxes on business and so forth. You know, kind of politically speaking, it's that it doesn't seem like a very wise strategy because a new tax almost always historically has simply been added on to the set of existing taxes. I think it would be very difficult to strike that kind of political bargain where you could actually get a substitution rather than the addition of yet another tax. I think that also points out how the Austrians are different from mainstream economists. Mainstream economists sort of reinvent, you know, invent these ways of making alter alterations in government that supposedly will make us better off if all the equations work out correctly and all the estimates come out correctly. Austrians are very realistic about their economic theory, but we're also realists when it comes to economic policy. And, you know, a tax, government almost never gives up on a tax, gives up on a regulation, gives up on a bureaucracy. They're sitting on like 29,000 empty buildings that they refuse to sell off. Uh, they never give things up. They only are interested in taking more. Remember that Richard Nixon, August 15th, 1971, took us off the gold standard temporarily. To what extent are taxes constitutional? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean... That's, it's, that's uh, a political question and a good question. I mean, the Constitution does explicitly provide for certain kinds of government fees. Um, you know, it depends what you mean by constitutional. Does that mean what was in the original document? Or what mo most people think what constitutional means today is whatever is the latest decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. So by that standard, everything that the government is currently doing is constitutional. If you mean... You know, did the founders have in mind anything like the kind of system that we have today? I think, you know, the answer is obviously not. Just to give you one illustration, when the income tax was first introduced during the progressive era or, you know, in, in the 19 in the, uh, teens, the top the top marginal rate was, wasn't it 2 percent? So the most that you could be taxed even on your, you know, your extra income at the very top was 2 percent. And a lot of people thought that was outrageous. But that was the only way they could get it passed by promising that most Americans would never pay any income tax, only a few, you know, a, a millionaires, and the amount they pay, you know, would be teeny tiny. Um, so that's one way of, you know, what, what would the, 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 the voters and people in Congress who approved the income tax in 1913, what would they think of the current tax structure or the tax structure in the U.S. in the 1970s and 80s? 
I, I suspect they would be somewhat surprised. Now, one thing is that um, the income tax f uh, for certain periods was considered uh, unconstitutional, um, and, but they actually amended the Constitution with the 16th Amendment, which um, allowed for an in income tax, even though before the 16th Amendment, Abraham Lincoln actually imposed an income tax anyway. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, just uh, as we learned just a couple of years ago, you know, the Supreme Court has now decided that a, a law requiring people to purchase goods and services from private vendors, namely health insurance contracts, is constitutional because that's a form of tax. So to answer your question, we would have to say, what does the Supreme Court think that taxation is? And apparently any expenditure that the government compels either to the government or to a private company could be considered a tax and according to the Supreme Court is constitutional. Oak, you heard of the Articles of Confederation? Yes. That's the document, the agreement between the states that Americans used to defeat Great Britain and become independent of Great Britain. There was no power to tax under the Articles of Confederation. The only thing that they could do is make requisitions from the states. And so they didn't have taxing power. And everything worked out pretty well, except a small number of states within the Articles of Confederation could block anything. So a minority of states, it, you needed more than a majority in order to pass something. And so the delegates would go there and meet in Philadelphia and they couldn't tax. And it was really hard to pass anything. And the little small states could block the big states from doing certain things. And the big states could block the little states for doing certain things. And so it wasn't fun as far as politicians go. So they decided to rip up the document and start over again with the U.S. Constitution, which does have some taxing powers in it. Okay, thank you very much. It's been a great day. And again, I'd, I'd really uh, especially like to thank the donor that made this event possible. Um, I think it was all worthwhile. Thank you.